what's up you guys marty schwartz here with marty music thanks for checking out this video i want to talk about when you get a song stuck in your head i'm sure you know what i'm talking about you listen to a song a few times and then even minutes hours later you're doing the dishes or doing something else and that song just pops into your head you ever wonder why that happens well, curiosity got the better of me, and I set out for answers. I linked up with Dr. Carol Sherling, a neuroscientist from Belmont University here in Nashville, Tennessee. We sat down and talked all about earworms and the neuroscience behind what happens when a catchy tune gets stuck in our heads. Carol's intimate knowledge of the brain made for a really interesting conversation. I think you guys are gonna dig it. So let's start the show. Tell me a little bit about your background, like as far as your field. So my background is in uh, what's called behavioral neuroscience. In particular, um, I've studied cognition. So what are things we notice? What are things we don't notice? Or what are things that make it into our brain, but we didn't even realize they made it into our brain? Uh, I also study emotions. So the effect of emotions on what we remember, how it can modulate our mood. And how does music play into that? Well, everything, yeah, right? right? You notice notes, you notice sequences of notes. Um, you notice a song makes you feel happy or a song makes you feel sad. And so all these things together, music is a wonderful tool to incite an emotion, but also to just study, you know, what are differences between clinical groups and healthy groups. Nice. This particular video, uh, we're calling it Sticky Lyrics. Yes, okay. You know, like the, the idea of, very simple, song getting stuck in your head or, um, you know, or a jingle. One of my favorite jingles is El Pollo Loco because uh, it's one note. Mm -hmm. El Pollo Loco. That's right. <laughs> Can't forget it. Yeah, so what's going on with, with sticky lyrics? What's going on with music getting stuck in your head? Uh, the clinical term we use is involuntary musical imagery. What's happening in this case is you are essentially reciting the same song in a subvocal way. And subvocal is gonna be used not just for lyrics, but also for the notes. And so what we notice in studies, um, so there's different types of scans. Uh, one is an fMRI. fMRI measures blood flow. Think about if you're running a marathon, uh -huh. okay? If you're running a marathon, you would need blood to flow to your legs so you could propagate fo uh, forward in the marathon. The same thing happens in the brain. If you're using a part of the brain, you need blood flow to increase to that part of the brain. Okay. And that's what we measure in an fMRI. Okay. And so when we have people who are talking about, I have this earworm, what we're seeing is an increase in the areas that you use when you're actually listening to a song. It's called the A2 area, the okay. secondary auditory. And so they use this area of the brain when you're listening to a song and you're making sense of the song. But when the song isn't there, that area lights up again. So it is literally like your brain is still listening to something, even if you don't have the stimuli there. Okay, so it's almost uh, an, an analogy here, because I'm not a scientist, but like a muscle yeah. that's been working. And it just keeps working. And then when you stop, your heart's still beating, your body, you know, and it's that's slowly... Correct. That's correct. Comes back down to, to pace. No, it's not lit to the same, it doesn't have the same level of right. blood flow as if you were listening to something. Right. But that same area that processes sound is still processing this subvocal sound for you. And so if I'm focusing on the fact that I can hear it in my head, that continues, continues the muscle, that part Absolutely. to keep flowing. Thus, wow, you're a good teacher because I actually <laughs> understand what you're saying. So there's some, also something else in the brain called mirror neurons. Mirror um, neurons. Mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. Right? It sounds very mm. futuristic. <laughs> There's this story that we hear in neuroscience about how they were discovered. These Italians went for lunch, came back with ice cream, and they were looking at their monkeys who had sensors in the motor cortex. That's oh, okay. Movement. Okay. And as they're eating their ice cream, they notice their monkeys are having reactions. Them watching the movement led to their neurons firing. Okay. And so it's the same idea. If you're an athlete, watching someone else do um, a triple axel, watching yourself in a game, or even thinking about it, you actually activate those neurons. Okay. And so a musician can do exactly the same thing. If you start thinking about the song, it can activate the mirror neurons. And that also happens with these sticky lyrics. Not only are you activating the auditory, but you might actually be activating the motor, the finger movements, or we were talking about Rush earlier, yeah. the drum rolls, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And so there's, there's a lot of other brain regions that come into play to make it a, not just an auditory experience, but a holistic experience, which is what music is. Oh, wow. That's 
that is really, really cool. Okay, so what's the process going on that leads to the song and lyrics being stuck in your head where it's out of your control? Okay, basically, if we're gonna talk about why we get them, we should talk about some of the features of the music itself that yeah. leads you to be yeah, attracted to them. This is where I'll take notes because I <laughs> yeah. can... This is how you can the rule secret, the world, the yeah, secret, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of studies that have looked at um, the concept of earworms. The problem is, is that there isn't a lot of literature on that out there okay. because they happen so fast. Yeah. The majority of these are pretty benign. They're positive or neutral. The ones okay. we remember, though, are the negative types. Okay, yeah, yeah. I still remember in high school, what's new, Pussycat? Man, that song <laughs> just went over and over in my head. I don't remember all the positive times. This is yeah, happening. yeah. They usually come into our brain when we're idle. You've heard it recently. You see something in your environment. Maybe you're doing chores, and your brain kind of needs to keep the stimulation up. So you'll get them. But the features of the songs that lead you to get them, fast tempo, lyrics, 74% of them are lyrics based. It's extra data for our exactly. brain. Exactly, it's an extra look cue. Me. I know, look so at you, you're myself. a neuroscientist now. <laughs> so it's an extra cue for your brain. Not only do you have a, a note, but you also have a lyric attached to every note. There's two ways that can be prompted in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, jingles are about 15%, and I think instrumental is then about 11. So that's the kind of prevalence. So if you wanna get in someone's head, music and lyrics, and the lyrics yeah. really, really make a difference. So as I said, fast music and lyrics. There's also the idea of you wanna go up and then down. Think twinkle, twinkle, little star. Yeah. You go up and you come down. So a rise and a fall. Mm -hmm. That tends to stick. Most songs that are earworms will have that rise and that fall. All right, I want to get deeper into rise and falls while I've got my guitar plugged in. All the basic melodies we hear are coming from a scale. The most popular one is the major scale, which is the Do, Re, Mi scale. <laughs> And so the rise is hearing and recognizing the pattern of that set of notes, the rise. So our ear picks up and hears and wants to go along for that ride. I always think back to my friend Tim Pierce, who's one of the most recorded session guitar players to ever exist, from Michael Jackson to Bruce Springsteen, back and forth. He's played, recorded on all these different albums and played on hit songs. And he told me that the most famous melodies are like nursery rhymes. And that relates to that rise and fall as well. And so a perfect example of that. And it's also one of the first things you learn on guitar is twinkle, twinkle, little star. It's got a note from the scale that rises up and then climbs down the stairs. So. It went up. And now here's the climb down the scale. And it's gonna repeat that to really set it in the wheels in motion in that brain. It's gonna go back to the original just to glue it all together. Another thing with the rise and fall that I immediately think of is one of the best and most loved guitar players of all time, B.B. King. He was playing a blues. One of the most famous things he would do would be play a lick, but then do a rise up to the octave. It's that same phenomenon, and I'll show you what I mean. You'll hear it right away, you'll know. As soon as I do it, you're gonna know. Here it is. So that is how the earworm begins. The rise and fall creates a loop in your brain and you start hearing that note and it makes connections. The descending, the ascending, the rise and fall 
it just stimulates and gets things going. It starts massaging it in there. And so going up and down, it's easily sung. Okay. We like things, we remember things that we can easily hum to. And you know if you have the sequence of going up uh -huh. and that sequence of falling down, instead of just jumping all over the place, it's more memorable okay. and you'll remember it. Repetition. So um, we were talking earlier, My Sharona. Like yeah. Seven notes in a row for My Sharona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's weird. You don't have that in a ton of songs. So repetition plus a little bit of quirkiness that also makes a big difference on how you're gonna remember it. It's right. gonna stick out. One of the worst offenders or best offenders, the way we wanna think about it is Lady Gaga. Bad romance. Think that, I don't even know how to sing it, but that like, rah, rah. Uh, so she has weird yeah. and up and down. Okay. All at the same time. Poker face, same thing, Alejandro, all of those. Okay. When they did a study, three of her songs were in the top 10 out of all the songs out there. Super fascinating. Yeah, and we can talk about her having synesthesia at another time, which is okay. blending colors and um, music together. All right, more, more, more. more ways of it getting stuck in your head. Familiarity. More, okay, familiarity. So the more you've heard it, the more likely it is to stick in your head. And this comes down to memory theories. So we learn by what's called chunking. We did a video with your colleague, Nicole. Who talked about she that. She talked about chunking. Yeah, and so for the musical experience, you want chunking, right? Because yeah. you wouldn't be able to process that two minutes of a song all in one. Musicians are a little better at that because of the training and so forth, but you want to take like a piece. Now, why does repetition come back? Well, if you repeat the same chorus multiple times in a song, guess what? You've chunked that. You'll okay. remember that a lot better. Yeah. And then you might put it together with the intervals in between. The more a chorus is repeated in a song, at every time it's repeated, there's a 7% chance it makes it to top 40. Oh. And then it will then increase the chance of it being an earworm. Gotcha. So familiarity, repetition. So that kind of plays hand in hand. And then there's the emotional content of things. Mm -hmm. So. If a song aligns with your current state, if you are sad, guess what you're more likely to have as an earworm? Yeah. Oh, a sad, sad song. song. Okay. And it's because, again, when we encode some things, we encode with a lot of different features. The sound, the lyrics, the sense of the song. Uh -huh. And that's another thing. If you're sad, you're suddenly searching in your brain for things to either reinforce your current state or to get you out of it. Most of the time, we're glutton for punishment and we try to reinforce the current state. Those are the factors that really lead to the creation of earworms. What would be the best way to get it out? Get of it your out. Head? Like what's the can we can we reverse engineer this process? There's lots of things, but none of them have guarantees. I saw a meme about like just sing happy birthday in your head or it, there was something replacement. Like that. Yeah. Think, okay. Sing, do something else. So sing something else. So if you have, for example, my, I'm going to go back to my what's new pussycat and I'm probably going to have this in my head later today. Yeah, yeah. I have to be like, okay, um, I need something else. So I can think of any of my son's kid song that gets stuck in my head and I would just sing that one instead going, this one's bugging me more than this one. So let me try to get this one instead. So A replacement, replacement, talking about it with someone else catharsis, right? Getting it out there, talking okay. with someone else. The weirdest one that's out there, but has some success is chewing, chewing gum, chewing food. Is it distracting that part of your brain? So it kind of comes back to the idea that if you are listening, particularly for with a song to lyrics and it's kind of going over in your head, you're doing what we were talking, that sub vocalization, right? So you might be engaging the motor cortex with those mirror neurons. Mm -hmm. By chewing the gum, you might be decreasing that activity related to the song because you're using it to actually masticate the gum. Is it successful in everyone? No, but it's nice to have that as an arsenal. And yeah. Okay, so getting uh, earworms out of your head, we've got replacement, you know, singing another That's song, right. play another song, or just chewing some gum, man. Yeah, just get it out there. You know, just, just start. Activate your motor cortex. You know and then there's the whole idea that peppermint can actually spark more. So now I'm wondering. Really? Yeah, so peppermint can actually spark better memory. So I'm wondering if you were to combine chewing and thinking of another song, if it would be more effective. Mm. Good stuff. I don't know. But then there's other things like imagery. imagery. Um, if you are a vivid imager, okay, um, and a lot of artists are, right? Imagine yourself going in your brain and pulling out the song. Not everyone's good at that. I know I would not be, but there are a lot of people who are really good at the imaging stuff. And then there's also distraction. So do something else. Uh -huh. So stop trying to stew. The more you stew about the song, the more it's gonna stay there. Yeah. This is called the suppression rebound. And then the last thing is to grin and bear it. 
listen to the entire song. Because when you have an earworm, it's usually just the chorus or just the intro. So instead, force yourself to listen to it over and over again in entirety, not so vocally, but listen to it. Sometimes that's enough for your brain to be like, okay, I've processed it now, yeah. let's get rid of it. Okay. So are there certain people that are actually more susceptible to the earworm or actually stronger against it? Everyone's susceptible. Yeah. Um, as we talked, 99% of people will report having it. But there are people who are more prone. Musicians are one of them, we've mentioned that. And it's likely just because they're around music. They're not just consuming other people's music, they're yeah. producing their own music. And I definitely know my ears are more open to That's music. It. You're more tuned to pick yeah, up on these things. I'm always deconstructing or hearing or breaking it down. Or yeah, so you analyzing. notice more, yeah. so you have more to trigger you yeah. to having one of these. People who are a little bit more on the higher on the neuroticism scale and people with obsessive tendencies mm -hmm. tend to also have uh, a little bit more of this. It's the idea that you perseverate on something, and an earworm is a perseveration. Yeah. Uh, research also shows that females. Um, tend to be a little bit more affected by it, not by frequency. So male and female will show the same frequency by, by duration. So mm. when it sticks, it sticks for longer. Interesting. And when you're stressed. Uh. Mm. And when you're stressed, you're more prone to the negative ones, <laughs> which just adds hey, to the stress. let's have fun. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Well, Carol Sherling, I just want to thank you again for this great conversation. Thank and you. Really, really interesting. I can tell you're a really good teacher because like you were leading me along and it actually, everything made sense. Music is such a huge part of our lives. Today, thanks to streaming platforms and social media, we're constantly exposed to songs. So I hope having a better understanding of why a song gets stuck in your head gives you a little more protection from songs you can't stand. And just maybe if you get a good song stuck in your head, you'll always have a song in your heart. Thanks for listening. If you want to check out more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel and click that bell notification so you don't miss any of this awesome content and you're notified. And look for Curiosity Stream on social media. Links are in the description.